you do when you see injustice? What do you do when you see someone being mistreated? What are some of the emotions that, that well up within inside of you? Is it, well, man, that, that's terrible, but I'm just glad it's not happening to me. Or, or does it make you want to step forward and, and, and to do something about it? Does it break your heart? Does it make you angry? This past spring, many across the nation were outraged by a video that was posted on YouTube depicting Karen Klein, a 68-year-old school bus monitor who endured 10 minutes of verbal abuse at the hand of five middle school boys on their way to school in Rochester, New York. In addition to making fun of the the bus driver's assistant's weight and and her sweating and, and different things, one of the boys asked for a home address so he could go and urinate on her front door. Uh, and another one brought up, apparently knew some facts about her family and said, the reason why your son committed suicide was to get away from you. These, these are some of the things that, that they were just verbally abusing her with. And Miss Klein, to her credit, tried to do the best she, she could to maintain her composure and unsuccessfully not to cry. But she sat there and just took every verbal blow that was thrown her direction. Well, collectively, uh, across this nation, really around the world, when word got out of this and people started watching this video, there, there were two reactions that, that seemed to well up in, in the hearts of most people. The, the first was, we want to help the one that was oppressed. And in fact, someone went down to a bank and, and decided to put together a fund to send Miss Karen Klein on a vacation. When word got out on some of the uh, talk shows in in, in the morning on Fox and Friends and and MSNBC and some of the others, over $600,000 went into this account. I I think Ms. Klein just decided to retire after that. But the the second thing that welled up inside of most people is we want something to happen to the oppressors. We, we want these boys to be punished, to be reprimanded, to be expelled. And after a, a local uh, television crew went and interviewed one of the fathers and, and asked him, and he, he kind of gave out a flippant response of, well, you know, boys will be boys. People were angry. They wanted something to happen here. Ecclesiastes 4 and verse 1, Solomon talks about this injustice that takes place. He said, again, I looked and saw all of the oppression that was taking place under the sun. I saw the tears of the oppressed, and they have no comforter. Power was on the side of the oppressors. And when when power lands into the lap of the evil, this is what happens. We see it around the world at different times. When when people are are coming under the, the thumb of someone that doesn't know the Lord, there, there's no one to take, about, take up the, the cause. And you just see it, and it, it just something happens within us. There's no one there to comfort them or to lend a hand. Here's what's really cool about this passage. It doesn't end there. And they have no comforter. Neither the oppressed nor the oppressors have a comforter. Well, certainly our our hearts go out to to those that have been mistreated, but do our hearts go out to the ones that are doing the mistreating? That's really hard. That that doesn't make sense. That's not fair. That's not within us. But after this story this morning, hopefully it'll be something that God starts working on within us. If you have your Bible, turn with me to Luke chapter 18. Because I want us to start seeing things differently, not just... A natural reaction like we have from our fellow citizens around us. If we're going to be of Christ. We've got to start thinking like Christ. I think it's, it's unfortunate that the two stories that we're going to look at, that those that were kind of dividing up Luke's gospel chose to put these in two separate chapters. Because I, I think the good doctor intended these two stories to be threaded together. But it's, it's important for us to look at them. Well, as a matter of setup, before we get into these, these passages... Jesus knows he's heading for the passion. He, he's heading toward Jerusalem. And he pulls his disciples together. He gets them away from the crowd. And he goes, I don't want you to be surprised. 
And I don't want you to think that when these things begin to happen, that I'm being surprised. I'm walking in with full knowledge of what's about to take place. We're heading to Jerusalem, the, the capital, and, and I'm going to be jeered. I, I'm going to be uh, spat upon. I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to be flogged, and I'm going to be killed. Y'all ready to go? And so they start heading that direction. Well, their last stop before they get there is, is the town of Jericho, about 12 miles away from the capital. And they start making their way there. And, and so they're, they're, I imagine the disciples, their, their hearts are heavy. Where are we going? What are we getting into? And as they walk into Jericho, obviously the, the word has gotten out. The local celebrity is coming. And, and people have heard, but they want to experience Jesus. And some of them think of him just as kind of an itinerant preacher that's traveling through. But this is entertainment. And so people are lining the, the roadways waiting for Jesus to come. And so you've got them kind of coming into this situation. So I want us to, to read with that in mind. This is Luke chapter 18, starting verse 35. As Jesus approached Jericho, a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard the crowd going by, he asked what was happening. They told him, Shh, it, it, it's, it's Jesus of Nazareth. He's passing by. He called out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And those who led the way rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and ordered the man be brought to him. When he came near, Jesus asked him, what do you want me to do for you? Lord, I want to see, he replied. Jesus said to him, receive your sight for your faith has healed you. It's just an incredible story. I, I think sometimes that we gloss over these things. So we, we read and we're, we're familiar. But don't miss how incredible that is. I mean, this is a miracle that takes place right here on the roadside. But I want us to notice in this passage the different ways that Jesus is addressed in this passage. You, you have the, the blind beggar that is there and he's asking, you know, who is it? What, what's all the commotion about? And the people in the crowd respond with, was Jesus of Nazareth? The last time that he's been described in this way, oh, that goes all the way back to Luke chapter 4, when Jesus goes back to his hometown, and, and as we read today, he starts reading, and, and people are saying, wow, that was incredible. But others are like, don't listen to him. We know who it is. This is the carpenter's son. You know, Joseph and Mary, and well, we're not sure how that all that happened. You remember? That's who this is. Don't be confused. It's just Jesus of Nazareth. So that's how he's described. Well, what does the blind beggar say? Jesus, son of David. That's how, how he gets his attention. A title that's only used here in by the Syrophoenician widow. You may, remember, she's the one that, that went asking for, for Jesus to intervene in her life. And he said, well, we don't give the uh, you know, food to the dogs. You remember, that, that's who uses this title as well. And like the Canaanite woman, this man is an outcast. He's a social misfit. Matthew would tell us that this blind beggar's name is Bartimaeus, which means son of filth. Let that sink in. That's how he's been described as fellow people there in Jericho. Don't listen to him. Don't even look at him. He's just a son of filth. He's worthless. He means nothing. Ignore him. So this celebrity comes walking into town, and the, uh, you know, all the townspeople are doing their best to roll out the red carpet to make a good impression. And who gets the, the attention? Who's the one that, that causes the, the preacher to stop and to look? <laughs> it's Bart, the blind beggar. The mayor of Jericho had to be mortified. No. I told you to move him to another street. So what are the townsfolk doing? They're doing their best just to hush him up. But even when he's rebuked, even when he's being dismissed by the crowd, he calls out even louder, Son of David. Isn't it interesting? You have a blind man that Luke says, he can see things more clearly than those that can see. He can see what's going on. He knows who this person is. And so he calls out even louder. What he's saying is, Jesus, 
I recognize you are the prophesied, the, the regal son of David, the promised savior of the people, the one that we, we've been all hoping and praying for. And I can see that you're that person. I recognize you. And you have the power to help me. If only you will. Sharp contrast to the crowds that attempt to marginalize this beggar. Jesus says, hold everything. Um, those of you that are kind of picking on him, I want you to go pick him up and, and bring him over here to me. <laughs> Isn't that ironic? It's kind of a nice touch there. For seven summers. I took groups of, of teens and adults down to Honduras to do relief work. On each of these trips, we'd down and we'd build homes uh, that had been destroyed by a hurricane Mitch years before. But one day, we would take out to go to a school for the blind. And if you've never had that opportunity to spend time with the blind, communicating with them can be an incredible experience because they don't look at you straight on. And, and in fact, their ears become kind of their eyes into the soul. And, and so a lot of times they'll turn their dominant ear towards you and their, their head would go down because they're trying to pick up on anything and, and everything. And they're trying to receive as much information. And a, a lot of times when, when you're missing one of your five senses, the others will compensate. And so you'll, you'll see them lean into what you're having to say. And if, if they start feeling comfortable with you, after a period of time, sometimes they'll start using their hands and they'll put their hands on, on your face or, or will, will grab your, your hands. I'm, I'm kind of an expressive person. So sometimes they'll, they'll reach out and they'll feel what I'm doing with, with my hands when I, I'm not even realizing I'm doing it. And so what's really rewarding about trying to talk with someone that's blind is they're 100% in the conversation. They're, they're not distracted at all. They're, they're not looking at someone else going by or, or looking beyond you. They're 100% into that. And it's really a, a real rich experience. So taking all this into consideration and spending time with them, I, I can't imagine Jesus coming up and, and seeing someone like this and saying, well, what can I do for you? I mean, obvious. it's obvious what they need. But as a blind man, I think what Jesus is getting at is they're guaranteed a couple of things. They're, they're guaranteed, according to law, some type of living. The, the people were required to take care of them and, and to give alms to the poor and, and, and to help these folks. And so I think that's what Jesus is, is getting at because you have a guaranteed income, you have an identity, and, and probably he has a spot. Everyone knows, well, he's about 50 yards outside of town. And as people are coming in, you'll see blind Bart there. That's his spot. That's his niche. That's his place within this greater family of Jericho. He probably has no education. He has no job skills, no training. And, and if he's healed, he's also going to lose what little income that he's already been guaranteed. And Jesus said, are you sure you want to move on to another phase of your life? He says, Yes. Yes, Lord, I want to see. What he's saying here in this word, finally using Lord, is not only, Jesus, do I feel you have compassion and that you see me like no one else in this crowd does, and, and not only do, do I acknowledge you have power, I, I'm ready to move to another phase of my life where you are Lord where I turn everything over to you. And so he calls him that. And so that's when Jesus says, oh, you believe in me. And because of that, your faith has healed you. And so by extending this special grace unto the one that's been dismissed by the crowd, in a way he's, in a way he's kind of given like a verbal hand slap to those that are gathered around. And so they're, they're kind of witnessing these things and they start thinking and man, Jesus has offered this special grace to, the, to this oppressed person. And so they're like, yeah, we, we kind of have done this. And so they start celebrating and they start, you know, cheering. Yes, he's received his, his sight back. And so they, they're, they're kind of convicted of this. But let's see how this same crowd reacts when Jesus offers special grace to the main oppressor in town. Let's continue reading in Luke chapter 19. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. 
He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was. But being a short man, he could not because of the crowd, so he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. My guess is, is this whole encounter with the blind man happened as Jesus was coming into Jericho. Zacchaeus wouldn't have been among the crowd coming out because chances are if he's despised as what a lot of people think he was, he wouldn't find himself in a crowd because a, a, a small knife could easily go in and then as the crowd dismisses, oh, well, what happened to poor Zacchaeus? I don't know, but I'm not going to lose any sleep over it. I'm guessing Zacchaeus remained in, in town, and then Jesus makes his announcement, I, I wish I could stay with you guys a little longer. I'm just passing through. Zacchaeus goes outside of town, hops up in a big sycamore tree just to get a glimpse of him as he's going by, hoping that, that the townsfolk won't have, have traveled out with him. He can just get a glimpse. So this is what's happening here. And we see that Zacchaeus has done this. So Jesus has said, I, I, I have no intention of staying until we have this second encounter, the second person that enters stage right in Luke's telling. Once again, the mayor has to be mortified. These are the two people you interact with? No. Now the system was in place what Zacchaeus was doing it was called tax farming now, I'd never heard that term before one of the scholars used it I thought it was brilliant and I wanted to sound brilliant so I decided to use it but tax farming what was an idea that that these guys would would go in and they would get franchises so to speak from Rome and they would go and they would collect money on taxes now Rome would, would send them a number and they're saying based on the population this is how much tax Revenue you have to collect, and we'll expect it to end of the year. And then anything that was collected above and beyond that, well, they got to keep. Well, what was interesting is, is most of the tax collectors wouldn't reveal what that number is. They're like, oh, you need to take it up with Rome if you're not happy. But the people knew that there was economic injustice here because this gravy, the things that were collected above and beyond what Rome was asking, kept getting more, getting more and more. And Zacchaeus was a very wealthy man he was a chief tax collector in town in cahoots with rome and on top of all this he was a short man that didn't get along with folks think louis de palma from taxi the despised head dispatcher for the sun sunshine cab company this is the guy that everyone despises when they just see him so he's not free to interact with the townspeople but zacchaeus is missing something hoping that this preacher has something to offer him. So he thinks if he can just get a glimpse. So he climbs up in this sycamore fig tree. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 5, it said, when Jesus reached that spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I'm wondering if, if the folks in town are thinking, yes, finally. Man, he's ferreted out the one person that's been driving us nuts. He has found the, the one person that needs to be called out. And they're expecting Jesus to step forward and go, Zacchaeus, you're a sellout. Zacchaeus, you are taking advantage of your brothers and sisters here in town. And it's got to stop. Because you are destroying and, and draining the very economic lifeblood out of this community and you're betraying God and country. And I expect the next time I come through, if I do, that you will have repented. That's what the folks are, are wanting. Man, go after him. What does Jesus say? I'm going to stay at your house today. What? So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He's gone to be the guest of a sinner. This is the climax of the story. Everything that happens after that is, is, is wonderful. The climax of the story is Jesus went into the house of this sinner. That's what we've got to focus in on. Jesus shifts the crowd's hostility from the one that's up in the tree to the one that's down on the ground, saying, put it on me. Stop looking at him. 
I'm the one that made this decision. I'm the one that asked for this invitation. I'm the one that did. Please take it upon me. And so he, he expresses this unexpected love and he gives him costly grace because it was going to cost him. Immediately they start talking about Zacchaeus and they start talking about him. He's made a wrong choice. We got Passover coming up and he's going to be defiled because he's gone into the house of a sinner. Look at what Jesus has done. And Jesus says, exactly. Bring it upon me. Stop looking over here. Bring it to me. So he shows him this unexpected love and costly grace. What's incredible about Jesus, and I'm going to, I'm going to say this twice because everybody wants to hear this. He neither endorses the oppression nor ostracizes the oppressor. Jesus neither endorses the oppression that Zacchaeus has been up to nor ostracizes the oppressor. Folks, I'm not good at this. I, to tell you the truth, I, I think churches wrestle with this. I think we're really good at calling out injustice. And I think we're good at pointing the finger at the person that's causing it. And I think we're good at, causing, at, at, at looking at those that don't see life the way that we do. We're, we're good at that. We don't endorse what they're doing. Sometimes we do it in such a way that we don't build bridges to those that need Jesus the most. I, I really feel like that we as Christians, those that, that follow the, the teachings of Jesus and, and look to Scripture, we're, we're becoming in a minority. We no longer have the luxury to just write folks off. The, the people that we disagree with, the, the people that have, have chosen to live life differently, we, we don't have that luxury. We're, we're in the minority. We've got to start doing things the way Jesus did, building bridges to people that think and act differently than us. We, we just do. The church is dependent upon that. We, we can no longer just pull back and say we're going to be separate and, and apart from them. Yes, we, we act differently, but we can't, we can't choose to separate ourselves from the world around us. We just can't do it. What does Jesus offer him? He offers him community. He says, I want to go to your house. I want to see what's going on in your life. The townspeople ha have told me what's going on, but I want to know what's in your heart. I, I want to find what what's happening. I, 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 I want to lower that drawbridge so that you and I can, can, can commune together. And the townspeople are, are, people are saying, no, don't do it. But Jesus says, I'm going to do it anyway. Later that night, they're around a banquet table, as the custom was. And you know, as they're reclining, no one has to prompt Zacchaeus as to what he's supposed to do. He begins thinking and looking at this celebrity that's come into town, someone that's crossed the picket line and come to stand with him because no one else was over there, but yet this person was. And what he says is, I want this community. I want to be united with you. And so he gets up to make a bold proclamation. And what he states is, I don't want anything to continue doing this. And so he stands up to him in Luke chapter 9, 19 and verse 8. He says, look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I'm going to pay back four times the amount. You know, it's incredible. What Zacchaeus does, because he looks into the depths of who he is, and he pledges, first and foremost, to clean up his financial act within the community. And he begins saying, if I'm going to pledge obedience to Jesus Christ, I've got to start living like that. And so you have this, there's a distance between who he's been and who he wants to be. And he says, I no longer want to do that. And so the first thing I've got to do is take where I am. It may not be where anyone else is, but this is where I am. And I've got to clean up this because that's what's keeping me from a relationship with God. And he says, once I've tasted this, that's what I want. And the costly love that Zacchaeus received is going to be the standard. And so I've got to show costly love and to the community that, that I've been harming. I want to pull the car over for just a little bit. 
and talk with you this morning about giving. Uh, you know, a lot has been discussed over the past few weeks and months and even the past couple years about budgets and campaigns and special contributions. All that is important. I appreciate our finance committee. I appreciate uh, Lincoln and, and Steve and, and others that, that do a tremendous amount and the, the time our shepherds put into that. And, and praise be our Heavenly Father that these past uh, two Sundays the Lord ha- has delivered and the Lord has given us and blessed us with the, the means to make up our, our deficit. But I, I want to preach to this church while we're in the black financially. We're, because I, I, I don't want you to look and, and say, he's just trying to cover the, the light bill. It, the light bill's been paid. But I feel as, as a preacher, I have a responsibility to remind you of the connection between our heart and our pocketbook. You know, it's interesting in, in Luke's telling of the gospel that you have the story of the rich young man that's positioned right before the story of, of Zacchaeus. So you have a church-going insider, one that says that I, all my life I, I've tried to do what's right and, and, and uphold the commandments of Jesus said, I still feel like something between us. Can you go sell your possessions and and give to the poor? I can't do it. And then you have someone that's been ostracized as an outsider that desperately wants something else in his life, and he finds community, and so he says, I want to keep that. I've got to get rid of the things that have been keeping me from that. And so these two things are put back to back. What Zacchaeus wants is intimacy. And and really, that's what the rich young man wants as well, but he can't release, he can't let go. Jesus tells his disciples when the rich young man walks away, he said, it's hard, it's hard for the rich. It'd be easier for the camel to go through the eye of the needle for them to find the kingdom. But then Luke says, don't give up hope on those that have been blessed. Here's a camel. He did it. He gave it up. Because he saw how important the kingdom was. A costly demonstration of grace given by Jesus calls for costly discipleship on our behalf. If you're currently not giving or not giving what you should, um, that's between you and God. But here's a couple things to consider. Number one, Jesus spent a lot of time talking about giving. He did because it's important. I, you know, uh, I'll talk with different people that, that kind of have a hang, about, a hang up about some of these things. And Well, yeah, I'm, I'm good with God, but I'm not giving. Or, and I'm like, well, spend some time. Spend some time not only communing with God, because I, I think if you find intimacy with God, nothing else in this world will hold, will hold you in. I mean, nothing's going to hold you back. You want to give, give God everything. But spend some time reading what, what Jesus said about about giving and allow God to work on your heart now, number two I would encourage you to begin by giving something as a preacher I I've told the leadership I don't want to look at who gives what in fact I really don't get all that worked up about the monies that are brought in each and every week uh, I my, my personal feelings are if we're about the father's business he's going to provide for us as a congregation, he's given us work to do, and we're going to keep going out and, and doing it uh, because God is, is going to bless that if we're in his will. He, he always has as a congregation. We've never been w- without. And if God gives us an opportunity, we're going to step up and do it. So that, that's where I am. But I'm much more interested not in how much is given, but how many checks are dropped into the plate. Uh, and I realize that it's much harder for some individuals to give in the others uh, and it may be that all that you've got is the widow's might but I encourage you drop that widow's might in because it starts to do something in your heart if, if you wait until well if we can just get a little bit it, it's not going to happen you got to start dropping that widow's might in now so you, you begin to trust in him I, I went to the Southern Hills Church of Christ when I was in college and they, they started this new thing called shepherding groups uh, where they had small groups and then shepherds came by and did this and the, the shepherds said, we know the college students are just here for nine months, but we want them in those groups. And not just a college group, we want them dropped into the lives of our community. And so they sent out letters. 
And so uh, I remember getting assigned to a group, and uh, this is pre-email day, so they sent a letter to, my, um, to the little post office box there, and they said, you've been assigned to our group, and here are the other college students that are in our group, but we want you to know we're going to be eating every week, but there's no expectation that you will be bringing anything to the meal. And for some of the folks in our group, in our group that was okay, but I remember there was a phone number there, and I called our host, and I said, I, I'm not good with that. Now, I, I was flat broke. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember some of the college days, uh, but they, they, this is back when $5 was a lot. I rarely put $5 into the tank. I'd, I'd walk up to the uh, gas station, and, and then I'd j- dump out $2.31 worth of gas and go, do you remember those days? Man, if I was going to go on a, ga- a date, I had to go collect aluminum cans or, or give blood to go. I mean, I had no money. But I called my host, and I said, I've got to bring something. And so she would tell me, you know, can you bring the paper plates? It's like 99 cents or, or two liter you know, or mustard, you know, for the hot dog. Yes, I want to bring something because it was important for me to feel like I was a part of and giving to that community. So I encourage you to begin to give something. And then number three, give regularly. Preacher, I, I, I just can't do that right now. You don't know what, what's going on in my life. The Lord tells us not to test him except in this area. He, tell, he said, trust me in this. T- put me to the test that if you give yourself completely to me, then I'm not going to multiply and, and take care of you and bless you. I, I don't know of any Christians that have starved to death because they've given too much. It, it just doesn't happen. God says, test me on this. So if you get into the habit of giving regularly, I promise God's going to provide for you. He's going to bless you in your life. Let's get back to Luke chapter 19. Let's look at Jesus' response to Zacchaeus' bold declaration. In verse 9, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save what was lost. Three points from this response of Jesus. Number one, salvation has come to this house. These words are recorded as a divine passive. Salvation has come. It doesn't mean Zacchaeus has achieved it. Salvation has come. That means someone else has brought his salvation over to his house, and that's Jesus Christ. Jesus is the one that that has stood there. Jesus is the one who has extended grace. Jesus is the first one to act, and then Zacchaeus responds in kind as a disciple. Man, And what he's done here is incredible. What he's going to do, not only for this sinner, but for all the sinners, as he goes to Jerusalem, once and for all, he's going to do on the cross. Salvation has come to this house. And salvation has come to your life. And whether you've received him or not, Jesus has already brought that salvation. Is just saying, come on, receive this gift. It's already been taken care of. Salvation has come to this house. Number two, he is also a son of Abraham. The citizens of Jericho written him off. We really don't want you part of our community. We'll do the bare minimum that we have to just so you don't starve to death and make us look bad. But you are ostracized as a person, Bartimaeus. You also are ostracized. Zacchaeus, we don't want you part of our community yet. You don't have the same values. You don't have the same way of doing things, and you're ripping us off in the process. You're out. But Jesus is affirming them both, and he's affirming Zacchaeus' acceptance in the eyes of God. This is hard. Whether he has been welcomed into the community of those in Jericho, God has welcomed them into the community. Currently, one of my personal prayers that I wrestle with and are praying for wisdom. And the prayer I'm praying is that may my tent be ever bit as big as our Heavenly Father's. It's tough. It's tough to pray. wrestle with that for a while. I pray this congregation's tent can be ever bit as big as our Heavenly Father's as to who He wants to welcome in into fellowship. Wrestle with that. Number three, He came to seek and to save the lost. Jesus is a good shepherd. He's not content with the 99. He goes out for the one. In this case, he goes out for the two. 
but he wants to go after those lost sheep. That's where his heart lies. But you know what? Our heart goes after those that have been oppressed, but our, is our heart willing to do, take that extra step, to go the extra mile and go after the oppressors as well? That's what Jesus did. He loved them both the same. That's our prayer. That's our prayer that as a congregation, we can learn to do this. Because we, we can go after injustice all we want, but until we go after and change our community based on those that are doing the oppressing, it's going to be hard. We've got to do as Jesus did. And I pray this becomes our mission, to seek and save the lost, that we begin to see people as Jesus did, that we begin to love people as Jesus did, and we begin to fellowship with people as Jesus did. Let's pray. Father, I confess in my life, I surround myself all too often with people that are like me, people that are good for my kids to be around and people that I enjoy being with. Lord, I just pray that you open my heart and open up the heart of this church so we have a heart for all. Lord, give us eyes to see the people that you see. We know that the harvest is waiting. Lord, give us workers to go out into it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. This time we have a couple of messages from our shepherds. Lloyd?